tam se. Jenny Ladder od Nitsi Kason. Gregit Lake Alberta Hotinia. Ja hatte moja nohe. Ate mona kagi piopigian. Kagi piowa siuyan. Tun stahi kwene gisksin. Tanta tanta gif lake is nagwa. Kaunu tegi huiget. Tanta gisip match toy si nuak. Tanta gisip match a hutu almina. Nato kwem kawi mams kutaman. Igus pigif lake. Mwotem sao. Mwotem kwen titi sa gaki wa wigi ak. Wima kwen duha ya na neksi si kigwa yo hika wicha si gwa o kigwa ita sko jwa sko tip chiga na. Gimo si poni naan ka kya kwe eksi se. Igwa ma kwe min duha ya na anta sa si wipa si wip tamik. Ma kwe min duha ya na an ta kya na wapah tamak. Ma taan si ta kam gak. Ut uma ja aski, kuaske taskamg. Makwa eksi se. Kakia oe kekje maakso. Ki ma mehti tuak. Ai sinuak. Mehti tawassa ki aha ja uivak. Laag hausis kagi huigi aak. Goh miena ja. Miska noa moe ohtse mi asna. Moe min mehti tuak. O tapa naaskwa kuhi tawak. O sampugu kitska gitn tapa soyak. Ma tika nipak simon. Tami wihta mi kuhi. Kauhi aate moyan. Hi. I'm Jenny Laderut and I'm from Gift Lake, Alberta. I'm telling stories on YouTube about uh, my childhood. Memories I have. Uh, growing up in a uh, tiny, uh, remote, isolated community in the north. Um, I have a lot of memories and I have a lot of stories to tell. How we lived, um, how people made a living. Um, we didn't have any communication system in, in Gift Lake. Um, the roads in and out of Good Lake were not that great. There wasn't that many people who had vehicles. Uh, but it was good. It was good. I hope you enjoy listening to my stories. The first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, something I, I forgot to cover in, an, in an, another video when I talked about community. This is uh, more of an, an uh, about e just one part of the economy of Gift Lake that I'm going to talk about because it was also a social uh, factor to that. We had um, two logging camps. Well, there was three, but I don't remember the one logging camp uh, that um, was there before Before I remember. The, I, I do remember two. Uh, one was Ernie Anderson camp. And the other one was Patty LaRondell La Camp. My dad worked for Ernie Anderson. Uh, so there was certain like loyalty to the camps by the people that are logging or working, uh, even, uh, you know, the families. And um, these logging camps, you know, wherever the, wherever the sawmill set up, then the logger, the people are, uh, actually doing the logging would go and build a cabin nearby, near the sawmill. And there'd be a, you know, a, a, a few cabins that would be built around the sawmill. And the sawmill itself, for the guys who worked there, they would have like bunkhouses, they call them, and they would have a cook shack where they ate. And so, these camps became like temporary communities. And they, they, they even got competitive in different ways. I remember one time that they had, they challenged each other to a hockey game, Patty's camp and Ernie's camp. <laughs> and Gitlake had a, an ice rink 
So they had a hockey game. So people came out to uh, root for their camp. <laughs> um, the other thing I remember uh, about having those camps and my dad working there lot, uh, as a logger, every once in a while, um, somebody would show up at our house with a box of food. Such excitement. Because what would happen is my dad would give a, a grocery list to someone going into Gruard or High Prairie. And this order like would come off his check, but then it would get delivered to our house on the way back to camp. And we would get so excited, you know, like we'd get food, different types of food than we had. Um, there'd be maybe a, a either a bag of oranges or a bag of apples, and that was excite, excitement right there. And there'd be like maybe bacon, uh, eggs we didn't normally have. Um, there'd be like always a big thick thing of bologna because bologna used to be like huge a long time ago. Um, one of the things that um, one of my treasures, I'll say, is this receipt I have. It's very old. It's from a Melvin Zachary store in Gruard. And this is an example of one of the receipts that my dad would get, for example, the, of what his order was and how much he owed. This receipt is original, like it's yellowed. There's little holes in it. There's a little tear. I take very good care of it, but it is dated January 21st, 1959. And I'll just read off maybe uh, a few of these items that are on here just for the, you know, the price factor. Um, an axe handle, a $1.20. Um, three, three pounds of three inch nails, 60 cents. Um, bologna. Eight and three quarter pound bologna, so eight and three quarter pounds of bologna, three fifty. Two dozen eggs. Oh, they were out of eggs. Huh. Um, ten vegetable soup, a dollar seventy. Uh, one pound of butter, seventy five cents. Four loaves of bread, eighty eight cents. Yeah. So, this is one of my treasures, but that was sort of a you know, where the, the, that box originated from. And, and we were, we'd be so excited. Talking about, next thing I want to talk about is Halloween. We didn't have um, Halloween parties at school or anything prior to, we had our night of trick-or-treating. And since Gift Lake had no power, like there was no, um, street lights, no porch lights to guide us. Uh, it was, we, we trick-or-treated in the pitch dark <laughs> and uh, you didn't want to lose your group because, you know, you, you, you wouldn't catch up to them because you can see them, maybe you could hear them. Um, we'd go to the teacher's houses first. We thought, well, Muniawak, you know, they would probably have better treats. <laughs> And then if we met a group of kids, they would say, oh, so-and-so has apples, oh, so-and-so has this, and we'd race over there before they ran out. So um, a Hall Halloween tradition was um, blocking roads, or pushing to outdoor toilets over would be the main thing. So a lot of toilets got pushed over. Uh, the other thing was blocking roads. So we'd block roads with like um, trees, tires. Uh, the odd toilet ended up on the road. <laughs> People would, uh, would be getting mad if they wanted to go by. 
in their vehicles that have to clear the road. <laughs> um, the next thing uh, I'll talk about is uh, there was a lot of talk of war when I was young. World War II had ended in 1945. So that was eight years before I was born. So I think the threat of war was still very real in the 1950s. We heard all this scary talk, um, mostly from Uncle Gordon. He talked about it a lot. He listened to news a lot. Like we had radios, the kind that hook up to car batteries. So I think he listened to the news a lot and he would talk about it. Well, you know, I didn't really know what a war was, but it it sounded like pretty scary stuff. But even worse and scarier were the planes. Planes constantly flew by above Gift Lake. And these planes weren't the ones we see, the jets that are so high up we can't even see anything but a trail of smoke that they leave behind. No, these were honest-to-goodness planes that we could hear them approaching from quite a ways. Like, they were really loud. And then when they flew by, they were pretty fast, but we could clearly see them. They were like the kind that you see in the movies. Like, I, I don't hesitate to call them warplanes, but they were definitely smaller and they had the wings and... Anyway... I had looked it up on internet and Alaska was um, an important air base for the USA prior to the World War II and post World War II. So, you know, a lot of air activity and I think maybe we were on a path up to Alaska because we're like, um, east of the mountain, mountainous areas in BC. That's kind of my conclusion. <laughs> um, in 1959, there was actually a uh, Nike Her Hercules, oh, I don't know if I said that right. Nike Hercules surface to air missile. So that sounds kind of scary. Um, that's what I had found on the internet anyway. Um, you know, it, it wasn't only one plane going by at a time. There would be like two or three at a time. Very seldom there was only one. And I figured that one day they would just drop a bomb on us. <laughs> when, when we heard them coming, we would like seek shelter, um, run inside, um, it wasn't just me that was scared of them. <laughs> this one day at school, I don't know what was grade one, grade two. Um, these, the pilots of these planes decided to do an air show or it was probably a, uh, practice maneuvers or something. And our teacher took us outside so we could watch them. Oh, I, I they were very loud because there was probably, I don't know, maybe six or eight planes. There was several. And they were doing all these formations and flying, you know, like you see in, in, in on TV. And right above us, I peeked up, but I did not watch them. Like some of the kids did, you know, they were amazed. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I saw warplanes flying over Gift Lake. <laughs> I guess I'll call them warplanes. That's what they were to me at the time. Um, another uh, social aspect of Gift Lake was um, funerals. When there was a de when there was a death in the community. Um, the men would like hammer, hammer a uh, coffin together with, with wood and the women would cover it with a black cloth and they would um, 
make flowers out of what they called crepe paper, soft paper you could curl and form into what you want. Um, awakes were held in the homes because we didn't have um, a hall, a community hall, which and where to have them. But an important tradition, and it's still practiced today, is, is the awake. This is part of the mourning process, not mourning, mourning process. <laughs> and it's, it's a time to express sympathy and to provide support for the family who has lost a loved one. You would think awakes are really sad occasions, and, and they are, but they are not only meant for tears and sadness. Fellowship happened there. I remember awakes where there would be a group of men who, who would tell stories, and it became a bit of a competition. The one who could tell the biggest, wildest lie of a story. <laughs> you know, they competed for that. There'd be a other, another group maybe playing a crib. Yeah, so, and there was these uh, people that would take on the role of Uwapanapuak. Uh, what that means is they would be the ones who would make it their uh, their role to come late, you know, one or two in the morning, and stay all night. Now, the awakes used to be two or three nights, and there would be people, like, all, all the way through, like, lots of people. Today, um, you know, people have to get up early for jobs the next day. So the, the, the awake thins out around midnight. But at the time, people were able to stay because they didn't have nine to five jobs. People lived off the land at the time still. So um, I think it was a time to, those times were spent with so much uh, visiting and fellowship and it didn't go along family lines or anything that they were gatherings where people, uh, you know, got close and stayed closer because Gift Lake was a close knit community. Another custom at the time was for mourners to wear black for a whole year after the death of a loved one. I remember my mom wearing black for a long time after uh, after grandpa passed away. And in the first year after a loss, uh, mourners were not supposed to attend dances or do anything that was viewed as having fun. I remember my Japan Billy Whitford's funeral in 1957. Now, Japan Whitford was a month short of turning 100 years old when he died. So he was born in uh, 1857. And I remember him. I was four years old when he died. And, and I, I, I can't believe that I actually sat on the knees of someone who was born in 1857. And that I remember him. His story is a very interesting story that I might tell another day. Talking about church now, church was a big part of our my childhood. We attended the Anglican church as a family every Sunday, but I found the Anglican church really boring. Like I, I didn't understand what it was all about. The fun part of that church for us kids was when Reverend Brown sang the hymns. Okay, first of all, he would sing by himself. He was very loud and there was no music. 
He couldn't sing Ritha Darn like he was saying off key so bad. And then at the end of the hymn, he would really drag out the Amen. <laughs> and and the kids, we would just be looking at each other and giggling. It was so funny. <laughs> In the mid-60s, a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Carol Hill came to Gift Lake and pastored the first evangelical church. I found that church much more interesting. For one thing, we had Sunday school, and I loved listening to the Bible stories. They had programs, too. Um, they combined Bible lessons with fun activities like games or crafts. Uh, there was one pro after-school program. It was called Happy Hour Club. <laughs> it wasn't the kind of happy hour people have today. <laughs> that was for the younger kids. And then I grew into the uh, Young People's Night was for the older kids and the youth. And that was in the evening once a week. Uh, and it followed the same format, like Mrs. Hill would read a story. Mr. Hill would, you know, have a Bible lesson. And then we would do a fun activity. And I have to tell this one, Mr. Hill, if you ever watch this video, please forgive me, but I have to tell this one. <laughs> one night for a fun activity. <laughs> Um, Mr. Hill tied up, uh, I don't know, two or three car hoods to his truck and uh, drove us around in a car hood with his truck. <laughs> uh, I don't think people worried too much about liability back then. <laughs> uh, every summer there was a, a, a Bible camp. About an hour, about an hour away from Gift Lake, Twin Lakes Bible Camp. And Mr. Hill would, uh, I went about three years in a row, and Mr. Hill would load up a bunch of kids in the back of his big truck, a one-ton truck or something, and take us to camp. For, and it was, we were there about four or five days. There was a girl's camp and a boys camp. We stayed in tents and we got fed and it was a lot of fun. I look forward to that every summer. And, uh, and, and uh, when I was 10, God spoke to me. He spoke to me in the way that I felt that I needed to know more about him. I felt in a way that I needed to uh, do something. I wasn't sure what. So that was God speaking to me. And so I went to see Mrs. Waynes and I told her, I told her, this is what I, I'm thinking, I'm feeling, um, what do you think? And she showed me, She and she led me through a prayer to accept Jesus into my heart. And I always remember that. 10 years old, a 10 year old little girl, I was filled with so much joy. And I, I walked on air all the way home. I felt so different. And I, I'm, I'm still, I'm a believer today. So I, I would like to thank uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hill and Mr. and Mrs. Waynes. They were part of that church too, and they worked in the community. Uh, for coming to Gift Lake, uh, becoming a part of the community and, um, you know, just just being there to to uh, minister to, to people in the community and to kids. The Catholic Church, I'm not sure when, what year it was built. It would have been sometime in the 50s. In the um, 
we didn't go, we didn't attend the Catholic Church. The, the only time I went to the Catholic Church was uh, one time they had a bingo there in the church. Like the church had a bingo in the church building. <laughs> I went with my sister and, and her friend. And, but then uh, Father Barato, the uh, Catholic priest uh, stationed at the Whitefish Lake uh, Catholic Mission, which was a reserve next door to Gift Lake. Then he built a, a show hall right next to the church. It was a fair size hall. And, but it wasn't um, really accessible to the community. That's all it was used for, was for him to, to bring the uh, picture shows. That's what we called movies, picture shows to Gift Lake. And then the odd time there, there would be a bingo. And, and the bingo is not, um, a community like for organized by the community it was uh, a church organized sponsored bingo there was only one time i remember there was a dance at that show hall there was a big meeting in gift lake for two or three days and people from all the other uh colonies they were known at the time the settlements across northern alberta uh there's eight of eight communities all together. Anyway, there was some big meeting and people came from those places. And I remember Adrian Hope was one of them. I, I, I heard that name. And until later, I realized that he was one of the uh, early leaders of uh, early Métis leaders. But I, it, there was some big meeting and they must have talked Father Br And that was where the meetings happened. I don't think I mentioned that at the show hall. And they must have talked him into letting them have a dance because that's the only time I remember there was a dance in that hall. Well, I have to end my story sometime. <laughs> I know uh, uh, bedtime. I remember bedtime. I'll just end with that. We were all be, t be tired and dirty Mom would help us wash up. Then we'd wait for mom to come and tuck us in and hear our prayer that she taught us. See, mom had 10 children, but she still had the time to do that, to tuck us in and hear our prayer. And this was the prayer that I that we, we, said, we said, I have to read it. Uh, Heavenly Father, hear my prayer. Day and night, I'm in thy care. Look upon me from above and bless all those with whom I play. In Jesus' name, I pray. The line, bless all those. <laughs> I used to say, bless roll dots. Because <laughs> I thought that's what it was. It kind of didn't make sense, but I didn't really understand in English that well. So I would say, bless roll dots with whom I play. <laughs> so I blessed my porridge every night. <laughs> but anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed my story today. And I hope that you tune in again. Igwe